Thanks for pressing play. This episode of Legends and Losers is brought to you by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite to turbocharge your growth. Check out netsuite.com slash legends. Today, my dear friend and co-author of Play Bigger, Kevin Maney. We have a fascinating discussion about a deep area of his expertise, which is how IBM won the first ever material uh, category battle in the technology industry. We unpack powerful lessons from the past and examine why studying the past, and in particular IBM's uh, road to victory, uh, can help us in the future. We look at how legends build enduring multi-generation companies and particularly how one CEO founder hands off to the next CEO. And we also look at why Kevin Maney thinks you need to know if you're a one or a two. All right, all right, all right. Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Hello, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for joining. I'm absolutely stoked that you're here. If you're a longtime listener, um, I hope you know we do this for you. And if you're a new listener, um, well, welcome, and we hope you love it. Um, now, before we get started, I want to alert you to a, our first ever spinoff, and maybe only ever spinoff, who knows. Um, we recently launched a spinoff podcast of Legends and Losers called Six Minutes of Legendary. Uh, n- no episode, and they're really more like songs or tracks, uh, is longer than six minutes, except for episode zero, where we kind of lay out the whole thing. And here's what you experience. We take clips from Legends and Losers. We uh, use special effects, and we embed them in music. And so every song that you and I have ever heard uh, is something that has been deeply rehearsed and massaged and tailored. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time somebody's taken uh, impromptu conversation, set them to music, and uh, attempted to create a whole new category. That's six minutes of Legendary. We design them to be motivational so that if you're at the gym or you're going for a run or a walk or you just want to get pumped up, that you could press play on episode one and just keep going. So check out Six Minutes of Legendary on Apple Podcasts and everywhere you check out podcasts. And if you appreciate what we're doing, please share Six Minutes of Legendary. Please write us a review and help us spread this new niche of music meets podcasting. All right. Um. It's grow time, and our friends at NetSuite want to help you turbocharge the growth of your business. Uh, Check out netsuite.com slash legends to learn how to create the foundation for achieving a whole new uh, uh, level of performance in your business. Uh, Our good friends at NetSuite are offering you a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry so that you can get to the heart of the matter of opportunities and barriers to growth. Now, At first glance, it appears we're at the golden age of entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, that couldn't be farther from the truth. If you look closely, what you'll see is um, businesses are, uh, business starts are on a decline. And a lot of entrepreneurs feel daunted at getting started. And even more so, it feels like it's getting harder to scale. Now, growing businesses are the engine of job creation, they're the engine of innovation, and uh, they're a critical part not just of our economy, but of the way people make their dreams come true. And uh, ultimately, entrepreneurs are the people who um, slay the cynicism of our times with their dreams. Our friends at NetSuite want to make that happen for you, and particularly at scale. And so NetSuite's the leading provider of cloud business management software. They offer a unified business management suite that encompasses ERP, financials, CRM, e-commerce, and more. More than 40,000 well-known brands and category queens and kings rely on NetSuite to turbocharge their growth. And now you can too. And NetSuite is a lot more cost-effective than you might expect. So check out netsuite.com slash legends today to set up your free growth review. All right. My dear friend Kevin Maney, he's a legendary author and writer. As I mentioned, he's the co-author of Play Bigger. Um, He's the co-founder of a new outfit called Category Design Advisors. So Kevin is now um, working with uh, entrepreneurial companies, uh, existing, you know, uh, large players on the question of how do I design and dominate a category that matters. He also, a while ago, wrote a legendary book. I think it's one of the most important books for anybody in business. 
and uh, particularly in the technology industry. The book's called The Maverick and His Machine, Thomas Watson Sr. and the Making of IBM. And uh, Kevin is widely recognized as, if not the, certainly one of the leading historian, uh, historians on IBM, and he's a student of what has uh, happened in our industry. Now, <clears throat> something really cool happened. The folks at, the, at uh, Wonderly uh, have a new podcast series, um, and uh, on that podcast, um, they, break, they break down, it's called Business Wars, they break down over multiple episodes what happened with IBM based on, uh, on Kevin's work. So on this episode of Legends and Losers, uh, we unpack the first category battle in technology to learn some powerful lessons. Here he is, Kevin Maney. Where driving will end up is it, you know, there will always, will always want to, you know, people will always want to drive a car because it's fun, but you might have to eventually go to some place where you could actually you know, it's, it's legal to drive a car, like you're saying. So I'd have to have my self-driving car tow my human driving car <laughs> <You might. laughs> to the to the human driving car track. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. see, that's, that, that yeah. is the machine or, or, that I am raging against, and I'm, I'm getting angry <laughs> now before it happens. <laughs> or, <laughs> I, may, or maybe it'll... <laughs> Maybe it'll be much like the whole horse thing. It'll there will be the, you know a version of stables, right? You know you have to go out to the track and your car's parked there, and then you can you know then you can drive it. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of good with that, but as a guy that drives a 662 horsepower Mustang I, I, with a stick, I want to be able to drive myself for you know probably the next 50 years of my life. <laughs> well, well, I that's would imagine that's probably that's probably safe for, for the time being. So, Kev, you just wrote this, l let me call it this, seminal piece of work here. <laughs> so you just keep writing these fascinating and interesting things. And, you know, uh, look, in some ways, I think, particularly in the tech industry, people, they don't want to talk about history. They want to talk about, you know, is, is Snapchat chat going to get crushed by um you know, whatever, you know, this, this, in other words, if the example isn't like immediately happening now, then of course it's bullshit. And of right. course, uh, the, the more learned amongst us realize that, uh, I, I, who said that, who's that, who, who's that great quote? If you uh, fail to study history, then it'll repeat on your ass. <laughs> what's, what's that quote? <laughs> I think that's Chris Lockett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, kind of like kind of like a bad meal. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's going to come back on you, and you're not going to like it. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> so it's, it's a way better version of the quote than whatever the real quote is. So I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> so, so tell me all about this first ever computer war. It was the first real category war in tech? Yes. And, and um, I will I will get around to, so just to your point about like why you know about paying attention to history. Um, uh, I will get around to the lesson in this um, that is is extremely valuable for a company like today today like Apple or um, it explains explains some things that's happened with Microsoft since Nadella took over. Um, let's come back to that because it actually is, pertains to to um, uh, one of the great lessons here. Yeah, um, great. But but I'll go back to what what actually happened. Now, um, as as you know, I, I wrote my favorite book that I ever wrote was Play outside Bigger. of Play Bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Other than Play Bigger, you, you, you can tell me the truth. <laughs> I can handle it. No, listen. I I know this about you. I mean, you are. Uh, you tell me if this is unfair, but. The IBM folks consider you to be the leading historian on IBM, yes? Yeah, pretty much at this point. I'm kind of the go-to guy. And uh, I love least, those. At least in the old days, you know, on the, on the Watson story. Um, so I wrote this biography of Thomas Watson Sr., who was the guy who built IBM. And he ran IBM from 1914 until basically he died in 1956. And so, the, you know, he, he, I mean, this is the guy, we, you know, we write and play bigger about category creation. I mean, this is the guy who created the the category of data processing um, yeah. and that whole industry. He's he's the guy and, that uh, created the computer, right? Well, well, right. Um, I mean, as an the, industry, I mean, I don't know. Did he sit industry, there and right. connect all the trans the transistors and the carbon angulators? I don't know, but he may he's the category designer of computing. Right, exactly. Um, and uh, um, so I 
I, you know, this biography came out in, two, I'm forgetting now, 2003 or 2005. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, it has become kind of the de facto biography of Watson and story of IBM. Um, this uh, uh, wonderful podcasting network called Wondery got in touch with me and um, they do ser uh, serial podcasts. Um, and they had started, just started one called Business Wars. And they, um, we ended up having a conversation and they liked the idea of me doing one about this particular moment in time um, in IBM's history in the early 1950s. So this was a really interesting project for me because I mean, I've written lots of books, I've written lots of stories, I, you know, all this. But this, the idea here was essentially to dramatize and serialize um, an episode from the book. So it was kind of like writing and, you know, adapting my book for a screenplay kind of thing. Um, and I, I love I was, this idea. I hate to interrupt you, but I just have to. I love this idea. This is, see, this is what we're supposed to be doing with podcasting. We're supposed to be experimenting. It's a new format. We're not time constrained. Uh, you know, our, the cost of this stuff is materially different than radio or television or any of that. And so um, I just love that you're experimenting, bringing your book to life as a, as a serial set of podcast episodes. You know, because, um, look, of course, you know, I love to read. Um, but reading is a challenge for me because of uh, my dysphoria. And, and, um, and so why not express your written work in a new way? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I thought it was brilliant. I mean, not my idea. It was their idea. And I thought it was brilliant. And, and actually, they did this wonderful job with, you know, they do like the old radio shows, right? They add sound effects and, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, drama it up and stuff. They did, they did a great job with it. Um, I always love those old images of like, and then she walked in and closed the door, and then there's the the, the announcement yeah. hits the block of wood, you know, <laughs> and like yeah, you know, right. all that sort of stuff, right? As, as the shoes that they pound on the table to be walking. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the um, the the incident or the the period of time that I proposed was this moment in. Um, the early 1950s and because there are two interesting sort of dynamics going on right then what now one is that IBM had already by that point been around for 40 years but it had built the company entirely on these electromechanical tabulating machines um, they were not electronic at all they they were mechanical um, and they had the punch cards and you know the whole thing whatever but this was this was the whole industry. This is how railroads ran, how the Social Security Administration ran, everything. Yeah, they, um, they had created what, and, what today we would relate to as the cloud of, of the time, right? The, the platform right, yeah. for running your shit all, all, For all computing, right. Um, and during World War II, um, the government funded electronic computers. You just, the, uh, we had a little um, internet, we had a little internet blurb there. I think Putin was, oh, okay. during, <laughs> World War II, during World War II, yeah. Putin <laughs> wanted to edit that out. He did. Uh, during World War II, the government funded um, research into this new field called electronics. And and that time it was vacuum tubes. The vacuum tubes that would like be in radios and guitar amplifiers. Um, hey, listen, but, as far as I'm concerned, it is not rock and roll unless it is a uh, uh, through a Marshall tube, tube amp. amp. <laughs> if it's not, go f yourself. <laughs> well, the Fender tube amps are pretty good too. I'll I take those too. I, I, I didn't mean to be, you know, I have a brand preference, but I I, I bow at the Fender tube amp as well. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, and you know, what it had come to pass was that these 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 vacuum tubes could be switched on and off, um, you know, very quickly to do the ones and zeros like we now know. Um, and, and these these vacuum tubes could do it thousands of times faster than these mechanical contraptions that were in the old IBM machines. So during World War II, the first electronic computer built was this one called the ENIAC. Uh, the ENIAC. E yeah, ENIAC. It stood for something that I can't even remember. Um, and it was built by these two guys, the two professors at the University of Pennsylvania. It's acknowledged as the first electronic computer. 
Um, and it was classified, it was secret, you know, during World War II. Um, and used to do things like, you know, calculate trajectories of rockets and stuff like that. Um, and so we get out of World War II and, um, and these guys and a few others who had been experimenting start to want to take electronics commercial. IBM is still completely built and all its profits and all its business models built on these old machines. Classic technology inflection point. Um, and, uh, um, and there was this other company, this sort of long rival um, to IBM called Remington Rand that was out there. And, um, and Remington Rand bought out those professors from the University of Pennsylvania and the ENIAC computer and turned it into what became known as the UNIVAC computer. So they had, they were ahead of IBM in this new field of electronic computing and IBM was still somewhat dismissing it. I mean, they were working on one in the lab, but they were kind of dismissing it as, you know, this is a same old argument, like when Salesforce wanted to put stuff on the cloud, right? Of what business is going to want to trust these vacuum tubes that burn out and can malfunction and put their critical operations on that. They are, they're, they don't, they're not going to want to do that. What business would put its data in this thing called the cloud <laughs> that we don't even understand and nobody can explain? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, over and over again, right? Um, and uh, now there's something else happening at IBM at the same time. And this is something that we'll get to one of the valuable management lessons. But um, so Tom Watson Sr. at this point in time is in his 70s. He is run IBM as a one-man show for 40 years. Um, he has a son named Thomas Watson Jr., um, who is this sort of, you know, upstarty young buck kind of guy in his mid-30s at this point. And he had just come out of World War II, and he joins IBM. Um, there's no obvious successor to Tom Watson Sr., and so Tom Watson Jr. seems like the obvious successor, but he's kind of not fully cooked. Um, and uh, this really uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 Tom Watson Jr. comes out of World War II and sees electronics and and understands the young guy, right, understands the new technology. He looks at it and goes, Holy shit, this is like this is big. It's gonna, you know, replace what we do before. We gotta we gotta run hard with this. And this sets up a running feud between him and his father. His father doesn't see it, he doesn't like it. And Tom Watson Jr. is like, uh, Dad, you know, this is going to kill the company if you don't right, do this. So those two things are in place in the, around and is 19... Is it the 50s yet or is this the late 40s? 1950, 51, 52, right? Yeah, okay. Um, the, the, so there's the internal thing between Watson and Watson Jr. And there's this external thing, threat of these electronics that are starting to come along. And um, the, the podcast is actually starts and is built around a particular moment on election day, 1952, uh, Dwight Eisenhower is running for president and his opponent is Adlai Stevenson. And, um, and it's actually one of the first times that, um, that a, a, a presidential election is being covered by television. And CBS News, there's Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow, all those old famous characters. Uh, CBS News has this idea um, of using a computer um, and the, the UNIVAC people at Remington Rand had come to CBS and said, we could, we, we could use a computer to help predict election results before they're actually all completely in, right? Something we take completely for granted today. Absolutely unheard of idea at the time. Is this the beginning and, of uh, AI-enabled uh, analytics for uh, elections? Well, I mean, like the embryonic beginning, I suppose. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, and they, um, UNIVAC convinces CBS News to use a UNIVAC on the air during the election um, and, and feed it data about incoming stuff and try to predict what the outcome is going to be. The CBS people actually go into this completely skeptically and think that this is never going to work. And they have all these such sex, uh, segments on the air where they're trying to explain even to the public even what a computer is. Um, it's kind of funny to watch. There's actually clips of it on YouTube if you want to grab it. Um, and, uh, uh, and at first, the UNIVAC um, seems to be getting the results wrong because the polls predict a close race and UNIVAC is predicting a landslide for Eisenhower. Uh, 
And as the night goes on, it looks more and more like the computer was right and all the pundits were wrong. Um, and by the end of the night, uh, there's a sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of viral public thing going on that about this amazing computer that predicted the results of the election and everybody starts calling it talking about the univac by the next day the headlines are you know screaming this about this univac computer and and ibm and tom watson senior especially is seeing all this happen live they're watching it on television um and and are mortified that um they you know finally realize that they are being beaten at this particular game um and so maybe uh, the kid wasn't so stupid after all and the kid wasn't so stupid after all. So, um, uh, no, not to get into too much detail, but that, that's sort of the dramatic, there's a sort of dramatic central scene in, in all of that that's happening. And what it kicks off is um, over the next four to five years, um, IBM throws all, uh, unusually, right, for what happens, we see these days, throws all of its resources behind this electronic computing thing um, and eventually just blows univac out of the market um and and the you final really believe based on all your research that it was that watching that election go down cbs news that said okay stop change start we see the future now we're going well um it was an important element but here's the other thing that, that happened and 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 where we get into some interesting things about way to the way to think about um companies that have a powerful founder that the company is really built around. So um, Tom Watson Sr., or Tom Watson Jr., the young Watson, um, sees this whole electronics thing, and, and the election results help him convince his father to let him run with this electronics thing. And he is the obvious like successor to Watson Sr. Um, and what's really important about this is that because Tom Watson Jr. latches on to this completely new technology and makes it his own and makes the effort of IBM to transform into an electronic company, it allows Tom Watson Jr. to not be Tom Watson Sr. Um, he does not come into the role of taking charge of IBM after his father and as, and, and, and as, a, as a successor who is basically going, I'm just going to continue his what he's already done because he was so great. He comes into his role as I'm here to now completely alter IBM's trajectory and make it my own. Um, and, uh, and, and that turned out to be the saving grace for IBM. If Tom Watson Jr. had not been there at that moment in time and not latched on to this and the, and the new technology had not come along right at that moment in time for him to latch on to, IBM probably would have stuck with its old ways of doing things. Watson Sr. would have appointed a classic sort of like COO kind of person to take over for him as CEO. And the company would have continued down the, the path that it had been and probably would have gotten usurped and, and, and whipped in the technology game. And I have, um, over the years, I, I mean, I, I absolutely believe all of that. And over the years, when I've looked at companies um, that have gone into to a transition from um, somebody who was a strong founder to a, a second generation, um, I've seen this happen over and over again. And you are seeing it right now. You know, when you saw Steve Jobs hand happened to Tim Cook, Tim Cook literally got up and said, I'm, uh, I, you know, Steve Jobs, everything he did was right. I'm continuing. I, I, my job is to be Steve Jobs, essentially. And, and continue the company in whatever direction he was going in and hopefully we can resurrect the soul of Steve Jobs in, in Apple. My opinion of that is that's absolutely what you do not want to have happen. You need a next person who is going to make the company uh, his or her own and, and take it in a new direction and, 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 uh, and, you know, and create something new. Um, I believe this is why Microsoft uh, essentially fell down under Steve Ballmer. Ballmer was, you know, Gates's guy, and and did not, you know, I mean, he was he was like just basically a a, a, a keeper of the flame. And it took until Nadella took over and said, uh, you know, now has made the company essentially his own for it to revive. 
and 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 I will I will say um, I'll add one last thing to that was um, uh, something I'm immensely uh, I guess proud of. Um, I I wrote a column about this uh, about this dynamic, um, and um, I had a I've always I had always had a pretty decent relationship with Andy Grove. Um, he would often write to me about things that I've written. And this was obviously when Andy was still alive. Can, and, can I just um, pause you for a second? Yeah. How legendary, especially today, when you think back on those emails or those notes he would send you that like, do you think back and go, holy shit, I was in, you know, somewhat regular communication, at least at certain times with Andy Grove? Absolutely. I, 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 always thought of it that way i thought like you know this is i mean this is our henry ford or our yeah. you know um the uh you know thomas edison or what any of those great indus- industrialists and um uh, you know i always appreciate what was always funny about andy though is that i would get these emails i'd write a column and i get the emails from him would basically be two or three words and and, and they would and they would be so blunt because it would be like like this is great, or it would be, this is stupid. <laughs> it would be that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the but, other thing, uh, I, I hate to interrupt you again, but I'm going to. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure I should say who, but I've, I've been in conversation with a very high profile individual in the, in the Valley that we both know. Um, and the conversation sort of centering somewhat on, on here's the theme. The idea, and I, I, well, neither one of us are sure we're right, but we're talking about it, that there might actually be a, a battle going on right now for the soul of Silicon Valley. That <clears throat> there's all this talk about, you know, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and all that, and there's the bad behavior at Uber and the bro culture, and then there's all the horrible Me Too stuff and, uh, you know, the fact that so few VCs are women, and, like, there's just... Oh, and there's a lot of talk about the, you know, the addictive qualities of all these phones and social media. And so, and so there's this really bad shit cloud right now over Silicon Valley. And there's, there's this quote unquote Silicon Valley backlash happening and, and all that. And, and I think, by the way, rightfully so. And, and, and I'll say we, because, um, you know, I speak for all of Silicon Valley, as you know, uh, we deserve it. But. I think about our last conversation about your new book, Unscaled. I think about the conversation I had with Duncan Davidson about that. I think about the conversations I have with guys like Maples and, and, and Mirako. And, you know, we just had Nancy Fund on the podcast. She's the original angel investor in Elon Musk's businesses. And we had um, Magdalena Yesel on. She's the original angel and founding board member at Salesforce. And, Lately, I've been having some of these incredible conversations with people that have been like you at seminal moments in the industry. And long story longer, Kev, the more I have these conversations, the more I think that you and I, you know, Duncan feels the same way, of course, that, that, that where we are now is akin to the late 1800s and early 1900s in terms of a massive innovation boom. And, and the other thing I've decided that because I think thinking about thinking is important. So deciding what you're going to think is a really important thing. And so I've also decided that even if you and Duncan and Mike and all these smart people are wrong about that, that I want to think that because I think that's a smart thing to be thinking right now, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and, uh-huh. and, and so I guess with all that said, um, there's a different level, this may sound corny, but there is a different level of consciousness if you say we're in a 15 to 20 year innovation boom that we really haven't seen in more than a century. If you just accept that and you know, think that, then you say, okay, well, conduct yourself accordingly. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh-huh. And so, so to get back to the Silicon Valley thing, I think, I think some of us, who've been around a while, let me say it that way, need to stand up and start reminding ourselves and hopefully others, hey, listen, all this stupidity, that's stupidity. We we need to cut that out. We need to grow up Silicon Valley, right? And we need to get to the soul of what Silicon Valley is, which is 
enabling that level of massive technological change in a way that's positive for humanity. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and, and it's time to clean up the Me Too and the Bro and the Cambridge Analytica and all the bad shit about Silicon Valley, which I think we deserve, but we, we're losing the fact that Kevin Maney is right. And if Kevin Maney is right about the innovation cycle we're in, if Duncan Davison's right, then getting caught up in some of the stupidity, we lose sight of what's really up right now. And, and we, need to, we need to focus on the soul of Silicon Valley, which takes me, I know this sounds like a crazy rabbit hole. It takes me back to Andy Grove. Of course, I didn't know him like you did, but you tell me. I think Andy would be pissed about all this bad shit. And I think guys like Andy would be trying to get us back to where we need to be, which is focusing on breakthrough technologies, building legendary companies and categories to make a difference in the world and stop all this stupid bad behavior. Am I completely crazy? Or what, what's your reaction to that? Uh, well, I would agree with you. I mean, I think he was, I mean, he was such a no, no nonsense, uh, you know guy um and he was interested in building things not you know not uh you know doing all this other crazy shit and so i i mean i do have a feeling you would he he would be on that on that boat with you um but here's the problem he's not here right like i don't and if some if other high profile leaders in silicon valley are saying things around along these lines and i haven't heard them i apologize but then you tell me if you've heard them i haven't heard many people saying hey listen yeah, we need to clean up this stuff. This is bad behavior. It's stupid. Cut it out. Particularly guys, cut it out, you idiots. Um, but most importantly, let's shine the spotlight where it needs to be shined or shone. shone, shone. Uh, I don't hear, if you will, thought leaders in Silicon Valley having that conversation. You know, I'll, Let me pick on one. Zuckerberg is not talking about this. They just launched a fucking dating app. And, and well, right. that was so <laughs> profoundly disappointing to me. It's like, really? Okay, that might be a great source of revenue, but like, you're no Andy Grove, Mark Zuckerberg. Like, why aren't you taking us forward in a powerful direction, right? And so I don't, I, I'm not, let me say it this way. I'm not hearing enough leaders in Silicon Valley having a conversation about um, the soul of Silicon Valley, which is, can we build breakthrough technology that meaningfully takes us forward and build the categories and companies to execute on that technology such that we do good things in the world? That's not a conversation that I hear very much right now. Is, no. Do you hear people having that conversation? Am I missing it? Uh, well, you're not missing it, although I would say that the conversation is uh, it's gathering some momentum. Uh, good. Yes. You know, great. And, uh, and, and, uh, um, now I, I'll, I'll give some, I'm going to, you know, throw some credit my, um, towards, uh, my unscaled co-author, you know, Hey Montanasia from General Catalyst. And, um, uh, I don't think, I don't think when we first started this project, he was talking about this as much, but now that we got the book done and out and, and it's made him, you know, and he, he's done some real big thinking, you know, as, as part of that, um, he has, uh, been hammering this idea of responsible innovation, to use his term, um, and and writing about it and wanting to go and talk to people in Washington about it. And um, I don't think it's just lip service. I, I think that he believes it and, and is looking for ways to invest in companies that are important and thinking through um, what their innovations are actually are going to mean to society rather than just saying this is a cool new toy let's throw it out there and see how much how much money we can make yeah um and and i know he's he's pretty dedicated to this idea and and good for him um and i i feel like there are other you know lights that are starting to pop up um to talk about this idea and i I think it's going to hopefully catch some headwind yeah and look i don't mean to be pejorative to all of silicon valley at all Uh, you know uh, and i mentioned nancy fund by way of example right she is the pioneer and she calls it impact investing and her firm Mm -hmm. is called double bottom line partners and what what they mean by that is that they want to have world-class returns so they're not kidding about making money but 
they want to do that in concert with making a big positive impact in the world. She's done a lot in, in environmental things, but they look at it, at, I think, very broadly, if I understand it properly. And, and her and her partners have a further point of view that says, if you have a, and I'm going to use her language, a double bottom line mentality or mindset, that actually the two things are sort of a virtuous circle. They, they fuel each other. They're not, it's not yeah. like, oh, we do good over here and we make money over here, that actually that's a broken paradigm. And if you're willing to consider the two things can actually work together powerfully, you know, that's how you get Tesla, right? That's how you get SpaceX. Um, yep. So I love that he's talking about that. I mean, if he wants to talk about it some more, I'd love to talk to him about it. I love that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's I think it's a good thing. And it's a conversation that needs to happen. And, you know, for that matter, as we've seen with Facebook and Zuckerberg, is that uh, if it doesn't happen, um, they're going to run into, you know, they're going to run into some some chainsaws at in Congress or the European Union or wherever else, uh, if not social, you know, um, <laughs> the, you know, the society as a whole coming, going back and going against them. And, and Facebook might actually find themselves in that boat if they're not careful. Yeah. And listen, uh, those of us who lived through the dot-com bubble, uh, one of the profound experiences for me of that was how fast shit can move from the way it is to some other way. I mean, it was that all over in the better part of six months for most of us. And so, you know, the thing that Facebook doesn't have is um, we could all get off Facebook really fast, really fast. And I, I don't know if they understand that. Like there could be a mat. Like if, 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 if a couple of the big penguins jumped off the iceberg, a lot of other people might follow them and, and they, they could be, um, they could, even with their size and success, they could turn into a pets.com. Uh, yeah. Uh, and well, as as you, know, as you point out, I mean, in technology, th there there is no safety, you know, no, no matter who you are. I mean, no matter how big you think you are. I mean, it's just nobody is safe from not getting, you know, murdered by some some new trend or new feeling about what how we use these things. Um, you know, our our friend uh, uh, Gina Bianchini, um, who you know runs obviously a a competing kind of thing called Mighty Networks, which is about building small networks, um, has been beating the drum lately and raising an interesting point of, do we really want one giant global social network? Don't we all really want our own small social networks uh, of our people? And, um, and so sh she's, um, making a case for the idea that the, the follow-on to Facebook is not going to be one giant um, disruptive social network that takes them down, but it's more likely to be a bunch of niche social networks that, um, you know, we all, we all might have, have five or six of those, which reflects the way we live our lives, right? We all have five or six social networks built around certain other things. One might be work, one might be our, you know, favorite sports team one might be you know our neighborhood um and and uh oh, it's already you know, happening i mean you just said it right we're on linkedin professionally and mm -hmm. we do i don't know about you i'm sure it's similar right i behave differently on linkedin than i do on facebook than i do on twitter and many of us now myself included are on next door and that's a whole other thing we behave one way on next door and right. one way on linkedin right. and so you know she might be very right and as we know uh kevin the future is all about uh, unscaling and niching down. Right. <laughs> I, somebody, somebody said that. It's, uh, <laughs> I got two yeah. plugs in one sentence. How do you like that? <laughs> I know. That's like, I can't even do that <laughs> for, for myself. <laughs> um, so I, just, and before, before I lose it, I'll finish the thought on Andy Grove um, that in the, in the piece that I wrote about this idea of, um, of ge sort of generational transformational management change versus just keeping the flame alive. Um, I actually pointed out that Intel did the same thing. Um, Andy handed over to Craig Barrett. Now Craig Barrett was awesome and I love the guy. He's a great guy and he was a good manager. Um, but he, his job as he saw it was to keep the train going in the direction it was going in. And, um, and, and, um, and, 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 and under Barrett and his successors, Intel had less and less success, um, certainly not the kind of impact that they had in Andy's years. 
And it was interesting to, I, I mean, amazing to me that Andy read that column and wrote back to me and said, this is, this is really a really interesting take on things because, you know, he had done that. I mean, he had actually lived through being the one who handed off to a classic sort of operating as we wrote and play bigger, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a milker, right. A harvester, yeah, a harvester of what had already been rather than, rather than a transformational person. Well, and to your point, uh, and we talked about it in Play Bigger, and I, this is maybe one of the hardest things to get right in business. You know, if you're, if the great news is if you're lucky enough to build a category king, then fucking A, milk the shit out of the category. You know, we had Mike Maple Sr. on Legends and Losers. He's the creator of Microsoft Office. Uh, I think it's a $70 billion a year. Pro it's like a giant a year, right? Like, and right. so keep going. Absolutely. Have at it. Congratulations. And so I guess you're one of the more learned people on this topic. You've studied it in a way that I think very few other people that I've heard of have. And so my question in that, Kev, is how do you know when you need to, you know, stop the focus on milking and start the next big transformation, the next big category, the next big innovation? How do you get that right? Um. It's a tough one. So l let me bring a different, a slightly different perspective to the same question um, that I, I, I'll draw on a, another previous book, The Two Second Advantage, which was about a lot of things about brain science and talent. And, um, and, uh, and this is actually comes from Ben Horowitz. Um, and, you know, Ben is one of the best CEO coaches out there um, from Andreessen Horowitz. And, uh, so Ben has this way of putting this, a theory, as he says, um, when, he, when he sees uh, CEOs and founders, he puts them into two categories. He says there are ones and there are twos. And, and ones are the intuitive, instinctive, creative, um, they, they sort of build mental models of things and make decisions really quickly. And, and, and ones tend to be the great, great company founders. Uh, they, they, they don't necessarily want to have all the details, but they can see the big picture and they, they can, you know, have the these intuitive ones ideas. are the better founders, he says. Yes. Yes. Um, and so that would be a, you know, a Steve jobs. Um, he would, he would put Bill Gates in that category. Um, I'm sure he, he would have put a, you know, a Zuckerberg in that category. Um, you know, they are, uh, they are that kind of leader. They are the ones. And, the other, the twos, are extremely capable managers. They're the kinds of people who probably went to Stanford Business School. Um, they want data before they make any decision. So they're the kinds of CEOs who will say, that's an interesting question of whether we should go down this path or this path. Let's study the shit out of it and come back to me with a report and tell me what, what to do. So the ones don't really, I mean, they'll, they'll take in data, but what they really are relying on in their instincts, the twos are relying on, they want to look at the numbers. Um, and one of, one of Ben's points was that um, ones surround themselves with twos because they need twos and they really don't want another one because who, they don't want somebody else when I was, you know, fighting with these. So, so ones tend to surround themselves with twos and they make the, their, you know, their, next in line, their next in commands are, are usually very strong number twos. Bill Gates had Steve Ballmer, Mike Zuck Mark Zuckerberg has Sheryl Sandberg. Um, and, uh, and ultimately the point is that um, if you're a one, you, you are almost 100% certain to hand your company off to a two because that's who's next in line and that's who, you, who, who knows the business and who you trust or whatever. And handing it off to a two is the wrong decision because the two is not going to transform the company and keep doing imaginative stuff and it's going to just basically try to continue what had already been happening. And to go back even to the IBM story, Tom Watson Sr., who was a very powerful one, uh, if not for the accident of birth of this Tom Watson Jr. and the accident of the technology changing and shifting at that moment in time, he probably would have handed the company off to it too. But he was lucky enough to hand IBM off to another one. 
And IBM was lucky enough in this really sort of morbid way to say that Tom Watson Sr. died soon after that handoff. So there was no other interference for the new one. Um, and, and that transition alone, to me, explains why IBM is now a 110-year-old company rather than a company that we talk about as, a, as, a, as an old dinosaur from the past. That's fascinating. Um, so is uh, Satya Nadella a one or a two? I, uh, you know, I, so Satya, I have never talked to in person, and so I can't make a personal assessment, but from everything I've read, it sounds a lot like he's a one. Um, he came into Microsoft with a new vision. Microsoft is, a, you know, if you talk to people who are at Microsoft now, um, they talk about it as like, this is a new company. This is like not even recognizable as the company that, that existed in the 1990s. And so that tells me he's, he's closer to a one than a two. And what about um, Roman Eddy at IBM to go back to IBM? Well, um, I, I definitely, I mean, not a, not a one. Um, she you feels know, like they, a two uh, to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, and it, it feels like IBM, you, you tell me, ever since Gerstner, was Gerstner a one in your mind? Yes. Yes. And you know better than I, but it, it feels like to me with this model that since Gerstner, we've had a, a, a cast of twos at IBM. Yeah. And, and by the way, also what's, what happened after, after Tom Watson Jr., um, there were, I think – but three CEOs after him, four CEOs after him at IBM, who all consecutively just kind of like built on the momentum that IBM already had, which is why we ended up in, in the 19, early 1990s with the company almost collapsing because it just had done nothing. It had done nothing new. It had not renewed itself. And, uh, and that's why Gerstner ended up having to be brought in to save the thing. And I have been criticized, and maybe I should be criticized, for saying um, that I'm bummed out that Steve Ballmer is running Apple. And everybody shakes their head and goes, what? And so in this construct, the point I'll try to make when I make that comment is, is that uh, Cook is a two, not a one. And that, that milking the cow forever is... On one hand, there should be a whole lot of people at a company like Apple milking those because they have cows to milk. That's but, right. But to your point, when you're not then on the edge, um, where's the innovation going to come from? Where's the new categories going to come from, right? And so is Cook – do you feel Cook is a two, clearly? Yeah, Cook is, Cook is a two. Um, and, and at some point, in, Apple's going to need somebody who is absolutely – hundred percent not like Steve Jobs. Well, and you know, the, the, the big uh, sort of cocktail party discussion, of course, is, well, here's what they need to do. They need to buy Tesla and make Jobs, uh, make uh, Musk the CEO and, and Cook the COO. And then in this, in this construct, they got a one, they got a legendary one and a two. Uh, and, and maybe. Uh, you know, I, that, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating conversation because um, I'd have to really think about moments in history where um, that, like, like a, a company bought um, another company to essentially get a one to run the new company or the old company. I, I, wonder, I wonder if something like that has happened in the past. I can't really think of it offhand. Well, and the interesting, the other sort of way to think about this is if you are a leader um, or a CEO or a founder and you're a two, um, what do you do? If you're, if you're, if you're a leader and you're a, and, and you are, uh, you're if you're the founder and you, and yeah, you're, I'm a founder, you're founder and you're, and you're two. two. Well, what Ben Horowitz would tell you is that if you come into his door and you're a founder and he thinks you're a two, he won't fund you. Uh, so only ones can be founders. That's his, that, that is his construct. Interesting. You know, it, it's, it, it, here's what I do know. I have known many legendary twos and legendary ones for that matter. The, the thing that's sad is 
I have seen way more twos want to be ones than ones who want to be twos. Oh, absolutely. If you were a one, would you want to be a two? <laughs> well, you know, I don't Look, I'm more of a one in this concept. You're a one. You are a one, Mr. Lockhead. You are a one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, we had, we had Cameron Harold on, on, on the podcast and um, he runs this thing. I think it's called the COO Alliance. You know, he's a, he's a, they call him the CEO whisperer, but he's a, he's a, he thinks of himself as a professional COO. And we had a big conversation about that. And, and I think, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. I think he thinks the same thing, but I'll, I'll speak for myself. I think it's sad that COO unlike CFO, unlike CMO, unlike today we call them CPO, Chief Product Officer, or CRO, Chief Revenue Officer, which is the person that runs sales. You know, those are jobs that people aspire to, or the head of HR, today we call that CHRO. And there's a career path to become the head of HR. There's a career path to become the head of finance, the head of marketing. And there are people, myself included, who I got to the top of, let's call that a mountain, and said, fuck it, I don't, I." I thought I was going to go to the CEO mountain and I didn't. And there's, you know, we talk about why if you care, but, but th that you could get to CFO or CMO or, or whatever and be happy and go like, Hey, ta-da, I like arrived in my career, but yet COO, I think you tell me is not considered a destination. It's considered a holding spot for CEO. It's really this. And, and, and I think Cameron's position is, Hey, no COO, should people should think of it as a professional role, something you should aspire to. If that's the kind of person you are, and I know for me as somebody who's much more of a one, your, your commentary, Kevin, was absolutely right. When I was a CMO, my, all my direct report, all of them were twos, pretty much. <laughs> no, because it took that much to, 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 you know, hold my ass down, right? Um, no, but, 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 but your point is perfect. And actually the, the, the point your your friend made about COO should be its own career path and its own thing is brilliant um, because um, the ones absolutely need twos. Um, they have to have them because of what you're experiencing. What I, I mean, you know, the, those are the people who who. who you know, nail the ground down and, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, do the, 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 you know, the analytical work and all those kinds of things, you know, and, and so all the, or many, many of the great ones, you can look at them and you know that there's a two right behind them. Gates had Ballmer, Zuckerberg has Sandberg. Um, you know, there's, it, it's, you know, over and over again, you can cite those examples. And, um, but to, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that the successor to the one should be the two, the COO. That's probably not right. That's so fascinating. And I guess if I could play forward, if the successor to the one was a one and that successor had a legendary two, in, particularly in a company that was a category queen or king, um, then the, the, the one and the two could sit down with each other and say, okay, listen, uh, you, the two, uh, uh, you're going to take the milking, right? We, we're Microsoft. We got Microsoft Office. We got Windows, like, woohoo, greatest franchises in modern business, forget even technology history, like taking care of that and in the modern world today, transitioning that shit to the cloud and embracing the new stuff and all that. The ongoing right. evolution of that is incredibly important and valuable and that's a big ass job and you should be proud to, you know, that's, I, I, I have no, I have nothing but praise for people who know how to do that. Um, yep. But yeah, in a scenario you. where a one, two partnership took, takes over for the last one, two partnership, uh, maybe I'm answering my own question, Kev, I'm sort of testing it out on you in real time, which is the new one takes over the breakthrough innovation thinking shit. The new two make sure the trains run on time and all that. And, and, and we try to reduplicate the magic of the prior era. Is that, is that the model? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, it seems like it should be from everything that I've learned and read about in history. And it seems like something that is very, very rarely practiced. Did Watson Jr. have an awesome two? Uh, 
Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I guess he did. Well, uh, no, actually, now I'm thinking it through. So there was this guy, um, there was the guy who be, who ended up succeeding him as CEO was this guy named Vin Learson, who was this like six foot six, you know, intimidating, like, you know, get shit done kind of guy. Uh, and now that you're making me think about it, he was exactly, he was a classic too. And he was the successor to Tom Watson Jr. Well, so isn't that interesting? Maybe the fact that Junior had an awesome two allowed him to do what he needed to do from an innovation point of view. And at the time, of course, IBM was a massive business and they needed to keep the trains running on time. How yeah, did, what was yeah. the guy's name again? The Vin, Lears, Vin, Vin Learson. How did Vin, Vin do when he took over as CEO of IBM? Well, uh, um, as uh, uh, another one of my friends I've had this conversation with is, is, was is Jim Collins, the legendary writer and um and he would often say um ibm by the time that watson jr left in the late 70s he, he had a heart attack and and left retired fairly fairly early um by the time he left ibm had such momentum that it almost didn't matter what the succeeding ceos did um for the next you know for the next 10 to 15 years at least um and uh, and so Vin Learson didn't screw it up, but he also didn't really take it forward. But maybe there was enough milking to be done that we could sit out an innovation cycle or two. <laughs> right, right. Well, so if you remember, uh, they, um, what happened in the, the, the ultimate expression of Tom Watson Jr.'s oneness um, was the introduction of the System 360 in 1964, which utterly changed the computing industry it was the most audacious act of category creation, maybe in technology history, um, and uh, and completely left IBM as the only one owning that industry for the next 25 years. So um, that was that was Watson, a Watson Jr. initiative that his successors never even came close to matching. And what made that so special? What 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 was what was what was it about that that had the impact that you just described, Kev? Um, before the System 360, computers were essentially all uh, one-off products um, that were kind of handmade and and, um, and and they didn't work with each other. So if you had a, if you had a computer and you had all your data and your software on it and your business doubled in size and you wanted a bigger computer, you basically had to throw everything out and start again from scratch. Um, and uh, and what the um, System 360 was the first line of computers. So they all were interchangeable. Everything, all the peripherals, all the, all the data storage devices, everything all worked with each other. Radical idea at the time. Um, and you could actually bolt on new, if, you, if your company doubled in size, you could buy another one and see it next to it, plug it into each other, and they, you could share the data and the software and, and nothing like it had existed before. Nobody was even working on anything like it, um, and uh, and it basically, the minute they introduced it, every other line of every other computer product that everybody else was just obsolete, um, and and put them out of you know basically on the sidelines. So they would literally change the definition of what a computer was. Yes, and that was you know that was the that was the mainframe computer that we you know started that we all that we know and love today over over, over a certain age knew <laughs> 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 about when we were younger <laughs> it reminds me of a conversation i had with a a, a younger person a, a while back where the conversation went like this oh, oh you're into music yeah okay what kind of music uh, rock music oh great what kind of rock music oh i like classic rock Oh, awesome. What, what kind of classic rock? You know, Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Soundgarden. And I went, wow, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden are classic rock, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Where we're from, classic rock is Led Zeppelin and The Who, and, yeah, okay. you know, right? I right. mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. No but kidding. I digress. All right. Well, um, anything else about sort of this the early transition at IBM and how they, how they so masterfully navigated this or this, this idea of connecting ones and twos to that ability to navigate from one era to another uh, on your mind, Kev? Well, I'll, I'll add one other thought about, we we're just talking about the system 360 and, and, and a, a very 
maybe <laughs> sort of uplifting thought for certain kinds of companies. At the time IBM introduced the System 360, it was 50 years old. Um, and the company so we was tend 50 to, years old. The company yeah. was 50 years old. Um, and we tend to think that companies that have been around that long can't do something like that, can't massively innovate, massively create a new category. Um, I mean, IBM bet the company on this. If the th System 360 had failed, IBM would have gone down like a rocket. Um, and, uh, but instead, you know, it was this wild success that changed the company and changed the industry. And um, so I point this out when we, when we were talking, when we were talking with companies about category design and we, um, uh, I, I throw up a, a chart of IBM's 110 year history and point to that place halfway through where it completely changed its trajectory. And you put another marker on here and say, well, here's where, you know, Facebook is what, 10 years old, um, you, you know, down here in the far end of the chart, uh, you know, so uh, the, these things don't have to be done by young startup companies. It is possible to do something like that. Um, and, and a company, maybe you just need a one round to be able to do it. Yeah. And, and you, you probably need the courage to hire a one as as the leader and that one needs to know that she needs a lot of twos around based on based on this and the prior one either needs to get out of the way or die <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lesson <laughs> it's like hey uh you know you, you can be the um you, you can be the chairman of the company but uh, uh you know um you you got to shut up or we're going to kill you right <laughs> <laughs> That's a new kind of employment contract. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I love it, Kev. Uh, again, uh, great thinking, great research, uh, very, very provocative, very eye opening, very illustrative. Um, and uh, thank you. Well, I, I love you. Come back and well, share more well. of your awesome thoughts anytime. It's, all, it's, it's always fun. It's just like hanging out with you at a bar except for 3,000 miles away. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the idea, right? Although I, I must tell you, uh, for the last two days, I've been doing this experiment called uh, How Much Alcohol Can One Man Take? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, was, it was just my birthday. And so, like, you know, it's a big birthday and all that. And, like, I literally woke up this morning and went, not I didn't feel sick or bad or any of that, which is probably an indicator of something else. But <laughs> But but my body definitely said, hey, listen, nothing, no more of that shit, at least for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't feel like. <laughs> All right. Well, I love you, Kev. Thank you so much. Well, th thanks for having me on. And I love you too. And, and uh, you know, happy birthday. Thank you. We'll talk soon, brother. All right. Talk to you soon. Be legendary. Right. Whew. Kevin Maney. Tell you. That guy has such a large brain. Sometimes I wonder why he, uh, he doesn't have to wear a neck brace to make sure his head doesn't like tilt to one side. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you shared it on social media. If you know somebody who you think would benefit from this dialogue with Kevin, uh, why not uh, email it to them right now? And uh, we would love you just a little bit extra if you took two seconds to go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you experience uh, Legends and Losers and write us a review. It's the way that we know that we're doing um, a job that you enjoy, and it helps spread the word. All right. We would like to thank Category Design Advisors. If you want to learn how to design and dominate your category and you want to work with Kevin Maney and the whole team, check out CategoryDesignAdvisors.com. The good people at Skinny Pasta, the official Skinny Pasta of Legends and Losers. <laughs> Taste great, feel great, look great. Check out GKSkinnyPasta.com. Heather Clancy and I have a new book. It's almost time. Niche down. Uh, how to become legendary by being different. Um, if you want the first chapter of Niche Down for free, gratis, send email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com and we will send it to you. Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need to build legendary businesses. OneLifeFullyLived.org, dream, plan, and live your best life. Check us out, OneLifeFullyLived.org. The Front Row Factor, transform your life with the art of moment making. The amazing bestseller from our friend and guest, John Vroman. 
Also, if you want to get into the podcast business, Podcast Pilot is who you need to check out. They are now the new producers of Legends and Losers. We're stoked to welcome them on board, Jamie and Sarah. Check out podcastpilot.com for editing, writing, publishing, and coaching on how to build a legendary podcast. Our good friends in Vancouver, Canada, Traction on Demand. I was recently up there uh, for the Traction Force Conference. We had a blast. They are the leaders in Salesforce solutions. So if you're implementing salesforce.com, check out tractionondemand.com. Dot com and Habitat for Humanity, a global nonprofit working with local communities across all 50 states in the United States and in 70 other countries to help build a world where everyone has a decent place to live. All right, we need to remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared it right now. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this podcast is hot. Do not pour it on your private parts. <laughs> David Lee Ross said, hey man, that suit is you. Don't forget, in the event of business bullshit, take two legends and losers and tweet us in the morning. Never jog near a prison. Support, support your local entrepreneurs. Watch out for Putin and only buy pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Remember to tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And Hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Marcus Rust, chief executive and owner of Rose Acre Farms. Sorry, Marcus. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. And I look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers.